I'm Never Lonely When I'm With You by Pacific Rimbaud. Summary. I won't take the room. She shakes her head empathetically. Living with you is totally out of the question. Obviously. But if I did, his brows furrow. Would you? 98. Do you talk to your friends? asks the therapist. Of course, says Hermione. They're my friends. They're supportive. Available? Hermione considers Ron and Harry, busy in London, and deflects. I'm tired of talking, frankly. Of listening. Sometimes even reading, if you can imagine. Hermione's also tired of therapy, which is mostly talking. Christmas? Studying. Hogwarts. A lot of the time. Yet in her eighth year, on the cusp of winter holidays, she's once again communing with a ministry-sponsored mental health care professional in a plant-filled room beside the infirmary. In the last year, says the therapist, you experienced grief, prolonged stress, insecurity relative to your most basic needs. Our bodies and minds have their own timeline for healing. Hermione deflects again. You've decorated your ficus. We have all sorts of needs. Christmas needs? Ficus needs? A need for tradition and creative expression, a sense of belonging, close connections with people who care for and understand us. Our needs are varied, complex, interconnected. I've settled on Cambridge, she says. My alma mater. The therapist smiles behind his weary black beard. You'll do wonderfully. But? I propose of nothing, Hermione starts crying. Yet another perplexing aggravation. The therapist pushes the tissue box forward. And, he says in his kind and patient voice, I wonder if you're lonely. Next morning, she walks the lakeshore, thickly overlaid with fresh snowfall, and finds Draco Malfoy on the western end, throwing things at the castle. He's horribly thin in his jumper, which seems logical, as Hermione almost never sees him at meals. Maroon-faced, grunting, and gasping, he digs barehanded through the drifts and emerges with ice-crusted rocks, sticks, once a handful of rotted leaf litter, and hurls them towards the school's outer walls. He's weak, and everything travels a brief, depressing distance before dunking flaccidly in the lake. Hermione toes aside the snow, uncovering pine cones, which she gathers by handful into the front of her jumper. When she crunches towards Draco through a knee-high snowbank, he gasps in surprise like a frightened child. Here, she holds out a cone. He grew over the summer, taller than Harry, shorter than Ron, because he's young and young people change. Hermione feels old and static as a Roman coin while he regards the gifts in her hand. He glares like it's a grenade, then at her like she's bitten for its pin. And that's fair, she thinks, because what have they ever offered one another but destruction? Fine. She lobs it at the castle herself, then fires another and another. Jacob observes, doe-eyed with disbelief, then abruptly resumes throwing rock sticks width of bark, rudely reaches into her armory to steal her ammunition. The missiles splash down, leaks from the target, sending ripples wrathing out across the lake. They exhaust their supplies and shout, flail, and kick up snow until Hermione pulls her shoulder and Draco's voice cracks. After long minutes, still panting, she scoops up another pine cone and cups it in her palm. Gymnosperm. She fingers it scarce. Winter damp, open, seats nearly all flown, then holds it out to him. It's no longer a weapon, but a natural artifact of potential mutual interest. A seed cradle. A woody bloom. A peace offering. They predate flowering plants evolutionarily by millions and millions of years. Blue eyes are more light-sensitive than brown, more vulnerable, Hermione thinks. Draco squints against the sun blaring of the snow, squints at her. Before his gone tragic face breaks open and he laughs. Throaty peels roll across the lake's surface on and on, until he falls under the force of it, elbow on thighs, head between knees, swallowing air as though he could fill out his wasted frame with it. You are... He presses a hand over his eyes. Singular. He laughs again, now restrained, plaintive, shoulders shaking, trembling hands hiding his face, Tears dripping from his chin into the lakeshore snow, which is full of rocks beneath the pines. 99. 
In Cambridge, a stone's throw from the Horace Court College of Magical Arts and Sciences, she rooms with a friend of a friend of Terry Boot's cousin. Harry opens the window ledge, closes it, opens it again, draws up the sash, leans out and scowls at the pavement. I'd feel more comfortable with a pin lock here as well. There's no flu. I'm near campus, says Hermione. I don't need one. Ginny sniffs Hermione's open wardrobe. How long have you had the dehumidifying spare running? Only an hour. Hermione hugs her cardigan around the middle. It's affordable. Anyway, shut the window. It's freezing. Yeah, only exits are here. Harry indicates the open window. The front door, the sitting room window, and... That's all anyone needs, Hermione cries. Who's this fellow? Ginny strokes a feathery Scott pine seedling rooted in a ceramic pot on the window ledge. Harry hooks his arm around Hermione from behind and buries his face in her shoulder. Oh, I'm sorry. You're fine. Hermione strokes his arm and nods at a seedling. That's Stanley. I grew him from a cone I found at Hogwarts. Neville assures me he's coming along nicely. Grimald is always your home, says Harry. If this isn't suitable, she grimaces. Harry, there are five exits. Hermione's flatmate is suitably clean and polite. She also dog ears her novel and installs toilet paper in the underhanging position. Hermione could tolerate both if her flatmate was ever home, but she has a girlfriend across town, perhaps in a flat less susceptible to damp. By November's end, always chilled, nearly always alone, Hermione yearns for warmer shelter. She spies the notice on a community board, magically camouflaged against muggle perception, tucked behind a flyer advertising a percussion class for toddlers. To let. Large furnished room in quiet country home. Reliable flu connection. Please be clean. Reputable. Non-flammable pet negotiable. In the end, she blames inattention and the hand nut jumper. She initials her inquiry letter and fails to think critically about the monogram parchment she receives in return. The provided address directs her to a stone house beside a mill pond, where she knocks and Draco Malfoy answers. Mirroring his all-eyed astonishment, she looks straight past him to a cheerful hearth, crowded bookshelves and a spiral staircase with ornately turned balusters. Fuck, Draco says then. Do please come in. Hermione lingers on the threshold. Are you going to insult me? Not intentionally. He rakes a hand through his hair, already tousled. He's pale as ever, though his cheeks are flushed, no doubt over warm in his heavy gansey. An opaque fog lurks about the hedge grow. Hermione shivers. Behaviorally conditioned to orient herself towards crackling fires and thick woolen jumpers, she steps inside. Would you like to see the room? he asks. She supposes it's the only thing he can possibly say under the circumstances. Correspondingly, there's nothing to do but accept. Upstairs, upon opening the door to the available room, she learns to count clawfoot bath behind painted screens and window seats below dormers among the basic requirements for human survival. Mine's just here. He indicates the door opposite. It's slightly larger, but yours has the better view. Does it have a name? The house, I mean. These places always have names. It's called Black Tree Mill. Of course it is. Why are you living in it? Don't you like it? She adores it. That's beside the point. I'm at university here. And? What do you mean, and? I'm at university here too, but if my name was attached to a stately home with 500 rooms, 218, I'd live in one of them. Then you'd be miserable. Would you like to see the kitchen? Downstairs, she accepts tea and, wandering on the rough-hewn beams, mentally catalogues his library. She strokes the leather spine of the complete compendium of Britannic counterhexes. I won't take the room. She shakes her head empathetically. Living with you is totally out of the question. Obviously. Not if I did. His brows furrows. Would you? No. She lays her cup and sauce on the mantel and tucks bubble-bubble temperature regulation and microbial ecology in the cauldron context from the shelf. Not if I did. Understand that while Crookshanks doesn't technically breathe fire, it's a close-run thing. Oh, I see. So you'd bring the demonic cat. She considers the book on Ben Pages. And Stanley. Who's Stanley? He's only small. Nothing to do with you. The following week, Jumper's stored in the cedar and lavender-smelling wardrobe in the room with a superior view, Hermione nests candles in a garland over the hearth. That one's crooked. 
Draco reaches round her and adjusts her candle holder. Leave it alone, she waves him away. You're doing the cranberry strings. Yes, but if I get too close, your fur-covered murder machine will bite my legs off. Beneath the Christmas tree, Crookshanks rolls onto his sign, stiffens his legs, then curls into a boneless croissant. Draco gestures at Hermione's seedling supported on a handsome new stand beside a south-facing window. What sort of person is this? A Scots pine. Ah. Draco hesitates before drawing a small silver wrapped box from a drawer. Here. What is it? Hermione asks. Nothing. He shoves it towards her. Take it. She opens the package and tips a silver pine cone into her palm. It's heavy and cool, scales tightly closed. I thought, since neither of us had ornaments. He turns away, takes up cranberry garland, and gingerly steps around crooks. I understand. Gymnosperms evolutionarily predate flowering plants by millions of years. Hermione threads her finger through the cone's hanging loop and swings it in the firelight. You are, she murmurs, singular. Are you warm enough, or I could put my wood on? I am. Granger, Draco calls from downstairs. Your demon's cat's taken an interest in our Stanley. On safe behavior. Thud falls progress up the staircase, and he enters Hermione's open bedroom door, gripping Crookshank's middle. Granger, Google whether demons are harmed by ingesting Scots pines. Mock cup beneath her chin, Hermione prods the laptop at the foot of her bed with a toe. Google it yourself. Oh, I'm putting another Terence spell on it, he declares as he lowers Crookshanks to the bed. The cat or the sapling? She blows into the market and sips carefully. You've grown him a cat safe salad bar down there. He's not going to eat Stanley. But if he does? Draco pushes his sleeves back and glows at Crookshanks like a peeved patriarch. You're worse than Harry for fussing. Or oh, better than Harry at fussing, Draco says. This is festive. He touches an illuminated string of gold stars draped from the bed canopy rails, then glances at Hermione and stills. Is that my old dressing gown? She adjusts the butter-soft linen lapels over her bare body, so flushed and damp from a long, deliciously overheated bath with clove and cinnamon oil. You said you were through with it. I did. He sits at the foot of her bed and nods at the letter and package piled on Hermione's desk. Busy post today. Christmas things, she says. Mostly. Draco's brow rises. Harry's in a bit of a tiswas, she explains. You know that werewolf incident near Fenditon? The muggle-born couple. Prophet froze over it. Miles from here. DMLE make their arrest. It's done. But Harry would prefer I spent my halls at Grimald. Oh, I see. You've deployed the tone. What's the matter? The moment Draco lies back, Crookshanks climbs onto his chest and begins rhythmically kneading his errand jumper. Well, it's rather insulting, isn't it? The implication that I can't or wouldn't. Draco thumbs the white blaze between Crookshanks' eyes. Never mind. You should spend your holidays wherever you like. But, she prompts, you don't exactly live alone, do you? Draco massages Crookshanks' cheeks as the cat settles into a rumbling, legless loaf on his chest. It's not just Potter that can keep you safe, that will. I can keep myself safe, she thinks, hinging forward to scratch Crookshank's scruff. Eyes closed, the cat angles his head, showing them where their touch best pleases him. As Hermione's hand travels, her and Draco's fingers repeatedly brush. Draco visits her room frequently, and she subtly encourages him. Maybe it's because hers is the better view, or he likes her cat, and the cat likes him. Or his eyes don't glaze over when she thinks aloud about atypical ordering in rune arrays. Or she once showed him the seed of her belief in his and her and their potential, then watched him cry himself hoarse in the snow. We'll keep each other safe, she says, then pivots the conversation. We should host a Christmas party next year. Draco stops scratching. Crooks growls and he resumes. With who? My friends, your friends. Your friends hate my friends. I hate most of your friends. I could change. Hmm. What are you drinking? Toddy, says Hermione. I'll make you one. I'm going to watch a Christmas film if you'd like to join me. The Nightmare Before Christmas? We just watched it. I want to watch it again. All right. Oh! In her haste to stand, she nearly sloshes Toddy over herself. I have something for you. Do you want it now or later? I'm stunned you would ask me that. She fetches a box wrapped in indigo-printed paper then stands before him, anxiously watching him sit up and peed it open. Pinching its hanging loop with care, 
He withdraws a carved wooden pine cone, polished to a gleam. Oh, the... Hermione indicates a bead at its base. When he draws the bead down, a chord unspools from inside, and on release, a music box movement plays a melody. Where did you find this? He asks quietly. I had it custom made. Tchaikovsky's sentimental. She rushes out. Tuned for. He speaks directly to the heart, I think, without barrier of pretense. But if you don't like it... He sets the ornament aside. Gaze locked on Hermione's face. He takes one end of her dressing gown belt in his fingers. Oh, I like it very much. It's entirely mechanical, she says. Knowing magic, you don't mind that it was made by muggles? No, he says. I don't mind that it was made by muggles. For a beat, the only sound is Crookshank's purring to himself. Can I ask you something, she says. Oh, of course. Why did you let this room? Honestly, if you're willing. Oh, I didn't like living alone, he admits. And do you like living not alone? Draco tucks on the bell gently. Very much. Warmth flows up Hermione's spine. She wonders how catastrophic it would be if he began slowly, she imagines, firmly to pull. I'll remind Harry that I'm in no peril here, she says, as long as I don't eat Stanley. Are you thinking about eating Stanley? He smells nice. Demonic behavior. The warmth turns fizzing and electric. It's the toddy. Is it? Mm-hmm. After one or two, it's not out of the question that a person would make unsafe choices. She's not widely experienced with men, but also not naive. She's aware she's strewn crumbs of invitation before him, a moonlight path he could follow, if he choose, from his perch at the end of her bed to somewhere sweet and dangerous. He lets the rope's tie slip through his fingers. You really are, you know, he says softly. What? Singular. 2001. We're inviting all of our friends, Hermione explains. In the kitchen of Grimmauld Place, Ron ponders his gilt-edged cup. All friends? He tastes the words and his face screws up with bitterness. You've become very sharing, the two of you. I could never have imagined. Hermione tugs at the cuffs of the conspicuously overlarge jumper, swallowing up her hands. We're housemates. Your friends? You hang out. We're worthy adversaries. I thought he wrote you a very nice letter. Your response was extremely gracious. Ron waves a hand. I've made peace with your living arrangement, but a party with who? Theo, not Zabini. Parkinson? Pansies? Hermione chokes on nice. An acquirable taste. We're doing the shopping today. I need an accurate head count, and honestly, I'll be disappointed if you don't come. Harry and Ginny said they would. Ron swigs the rest of his tea. Apparently, so will I. That afternoon, leaning on the trolley grip, Draco consults the list hovering over the basket. We need uh, three dozen, he recalls. That's so many eggs. Ron's a yes, Hermione relays. And you're the one who wants croquembouche. So badly. Grab a bag of crisps for me, please. Christmas is not Christmas. Draco snacks two bags of salt and vinegar crisps and tosses them into the basket. Without croquembouche. Your child was, was not normal in any respect. Stay out of the pastry. You're doing the cheese thing. Antipasto cheese ball Christmas tree. Shh. Draco hovers a hand over her lips. If you speak its name, you give it power. I will bite ye. He lowers his arm. You make these promises and nothing ever comes of them. You agreed. It looked impressive in the magazine. I was responding to the advert for moisturizing shampoo on the opposite page. She pushes his hair back from his temple. You're perfectly moist. Draco shudders. What? Hermione drops her eyelids to a sensual half mask. Moist. Moist, he repeats. Moist. No one wants it. Why not damp? Goodness, Malfoy, your pot a shoe is lovely and damp. Juicy, Draco offers. Claggy. Her claggy center, Draco purrs. I could write one of your pornographic novels. You're categorically disallowed. The warm, soupy heat of her. Her tantalizing faults, origami crisp, breathes Hermione. Stop turning me on at a supermarket, Granger. He steers the car towards a display of Christmas paraphernalia. Glass globes with minuscule toy dancers twirling inside. Crackers that burst into snow showers. Wind-up tin auras and uniform pointing sparking wands. Do you think Stanley's old enough? He asks. Hopefully. Indicating a selection of miniature tree decorations. Fairy lights, glass icicles and thready tinsel. I don't know. 
she hedges. They grow up too fast. Draco sighs. Stop making those eyes at me, she says. Your eyes do nothing. They do everything. Draco gazes at Emma Rosely. Look how tragic, how tearful, how lachrymose, how... No, but they are so moist. A week later, unwittingly occupying Draco's favourite spot on the sofa, Ron considers his fourth pastry puff. These are bilful right. At the bar, champagne bottle in hand, Draco pauses. A bit off? Hermione lays a hand over his mouth. Shh, he's being nice. Yes, but I'm being nicer. Draco complains into her palm. She drops her hand and meditates on several ranks of empty coupe glasses. We need another bottle. Feet smarting in heels, she clicks kitchen wand, away from the wondrous tableau. Theo grinning like Eva Novello at the piano, Neville in a tie, scanning the houseplants for signs of neglect. Pansy sunk into the sofa cushions, glinting and latently sharp as a lost diamond earring, enthusing sincerely about Ginny's party dress. Draco trails after Hermione, takes the bottle, she passes him from the fridge, then reaches over her shoulder for another. Two more is plenty, she scolds. One's for us. She shuts the fridge and leans against the worktop to watch Draco untwist the muslet. Oh, I think it's gone well, don't you? I do, so we're doing a toast. They're all waiting. But the cork pops and he pulls the flutes from their mercilessly organized cupboard and fills them halfway. Imani accepts a glass and, copying Draco's example, lifts it. Two housemates, he says. Two worthy adversaries, Hermione offers. Two sulking thieves with an insatiable taste for my jumpers. Two patissiers and their tender balls. He chokes back a laugh. Two friends. Go on, Hermione prompts. Cheeks flushed, eyes aglow, with wine he thinks his glass against hers. With whom we feel less alone. They return with chilly bottles and toasts to a happy Christmas and the coming new year. Hermione chases the tart apple fizz of brood with long swallows of self-candor, privately wondering at the improbability of being Draco Malfoy's acknowledged friend and at her restless, relentless, reckless desire to know what it would be like to be more. You've spangled your baby tree. Ginny peers at a crystal pine cone magically suspended from Stanley's stoutest excuse for a branch. Hermione, this is singular. The cone slowly pirouettes inside a private snowfall, its scales chiming in pentatonic accord, splintering the room's candlelight into a thousand prismatic scraps. From across the room, Draco, proud gift giver, catches Hermione's eyes. And me, he seems to ask. Hermione turns away and smiles into her coop. And you, she thinks. You know. You know, you know, and you. 2002. I liked Mrs. Claus look. Jenny holds a rat bra trimmed with a white marabou to her chest. Careful some milk and cookies. If you sing put us into Father Christmas roleplay, I'm obliviating myself, says Pansy. Hermione strokes a sheer green bodysuit. This one's beautiful. You should wear that one around the mill, Jenny suggests. Wax the floors in it. Peppermint Mocha slides down the wrong tube and Hermione cuffs until her eyes stream. What? Subtle, Weasley, says Pansy. They scream Quidditch whack. She points at a sterapy black bra. Get it for the university bee to Granger. Brian and I split this morning, actually, says Hermione, casting a swift scorchify on her scarf. We're shopping for Daphne's bridal shower. This is all off topic. Ginny and Pansy exchange look. Does that throw of seating for your dinner party? Pansy asks. Ginny twangs a thong at Pansy's elbow. I think Princess Perky Buttons means, or you're right. I'm perfectly fine, says Hermione. It was mutual. Pansy snorts into her cappuccino. It wasn't serious, Hermione says. No one was actually ever a wag. He absolutely thought you were his wag, says Ginny. Hermione's cheeks burn as she holds up a diaphanous pink bra. What about this? Does Draco know? Pansy asks. We don't really talk about the people we're seeing. Rehanging the bra, Hermione pauses. Princess Perky Buttons? Fox is doing burlesque, says Ginny. It's voila la vie, says Pansy. Not Princess fucking Perky Buttons. I'm putting all the dance instructions mother forced on me to good use. Here. She yanks the green bodysuit off the rack and thwacks it into Hermione's chest. Waxing the floors is a scene. You'll want to hand wash, then hang it to dry somewhere Draco will accidentally see it. 
Hermione sputters into her makeup. What the hell? Trailing snow through the flue that evening, Hermione throws her Diagon packages on her bed. After a blistering hot bath, she slumps downstairs wearing Draco's old robe over one of his undershirts, hair piled on her head. Draco's in the kitchen in a suit and tie, unpacking a paper takeaway bag onto the island. Hermione leans in the archway. I thought you were taking Emily to dinner. I brought you greasy garbage. We have haddock, chips, curry sauce, veg, spring rolls, and... He pulls chilled Sauvignon Blanc from a second bag. I thought this looked promising. Draco plates the food onto the formal china, insists they use every day. Touching silverware plates, balanced on his arm, bottle under his elbow, he heads towards the sitting room. Grab the glasses. He lays out, place settings side by side, on the coffee table, then searches his discarded suit coat and reveals a DVD of Amélie. That French film you like. Hermione begins to cry. Oh shit, Draco tosses the film aside. Damn it, I'm sorry. We were having drinks and ran into the chaser from my tincture's module and Brian Orion. They were, I just thought you might need, fuck. Hermione wipes her cheeks with the back of her wrist. You don't have to use his whole name every time. I won't mention him again, he's a fucking wanker. He's not a wanker. I disrespectfully disagree. I broke up with him, not the other way around. You did. She presses her palms over her eyes. You know how you can be with another person, even in bed, and feel so alone. The room falls briefly silent. I do. God, I've messed up the seating chart for the dinner. You haven't messed up anything. We just shifted down two. Blinking, she looks out through a saline haze. Two. During the sorbet course, Pansy pontificates on the topic of erotic fandoms. It's a tease. An artful, cheeky seduction. It's not rip off your G-string and toss it over some Pontus face. She waves a wine glass. And how different performance art. Oh, I'd love to watch you, says Neville dutifully tracking her entire speech. Every centimeter of him goes pink as a scolded schoolboy. He changes the subject. Your pine is really robust, Hermione. You've been taking very good care of it. Draco's favorite child, says Hermione. My youngest son. Draco declares elegantly in his cups. Stanley Shankrooks Granger Malfoy, middle name after my wicked stepsons, who will try to eat him. Theo leans towards Hermione and mutters, He's well shot of that insipid medievalist. Emma? Emily. A bleak eight month for us all. He refills his wine. You make him completely ridiculous, you know. I think he always was, secretly. Hermione catches Draco's eye at the table opposite end. Absurd, man. Hermione? Theo lays his hand over hers and speaks slowly, like he's explaining something complicated to a tiny child. You make him happy. On her hands and knees, Hermione summons a stray utensil from under the sofa. Your early gift is on the hearth, if you'd like it. Draco crosses the room and she hears him tearing paper. She sits back on her haunches, reliantly wielding a fish fork. What do you think? He holds up a stunningly elaborate charmed origami pinecone in white rice paper, glowing from inside. Its gales slowly open and more than a hundred paper seeds drift out in a snowy halo. Each hovers and vanishes in a tiny white blizzard, like an exhausted ember's last gas. The scales close, then it pauses and starts again. It's Japanese muckle art. The charm's elegant. Hermione stands up and sends the fork drifting towards the kitchen. The artist is muggleborn. Oh, I thought you'd like it. Daiko sets the ornament carefully aside, then leans against the mantel, hands in pockets. You're so fucking beautiful. Inside, Hermione flares like a furnace. Anxiously, she touches the placard of her white button-up blouse. Pansy confirmed it was a good look. The red lip was her idea. The shirt's not secretly yours, if you were wondering. No. He pushes off the mantle and meets her in the center of the room. Taking her wrist in hand, he turns it to look at her cufflinks. Just these? I asked. He slides his fingertips under the sleeve and along the inside of her wrist, which she swept with the woody fragrance he occasionally wears. And this? I also asked. That's good. Draco cups her jaw and strokes his thumb across her bottom lip. People should ask before they take things. Her lips part at his touch. I never feel alone when I'm with you. No. Sometimes, she says, I want to kiss you. 
Sometimes. All the time. I see. Hermione once found a source of her misery laid open in the snow. She had every reason to leave it there, but out of curiosity, maybe more than compassion, chose to glance at what it held inside. Four winters separate the husk of a boy from the man before her. He grew because he was young, and young people change. One by one, he slips her buttons loose. I have no right to do this. She grant him the privilege. You really shouldn't let me. He parts her blouse to either side and contemplates her body in green lace. I must admit, I was hoping. Did you hang this to dry in the bath on purpose? That was Pansy's idea. Jenny suggested I wear it to wax the floors. Draco cups her breast. A vista of possibilities opens before us. Should I kiss you? If you don't, I'll die right here. In the room with the superior view, Hermione never once, in all the time Draco spends delving between her lips or legs, feels lonely. She is enthralled by his patience in peeling away her clothes, by his hair soft against her thighs, by the rhythm of her creaking bed. She wanders at the side and taste of him. That she could find a man's weeping arousal beautiful and crave its imposition at the back of her tongue. She commits to her dissolute performance, no teasing or seduction, only sweat on the pillow and his voice in her ear, his thump against her tongue inside her open mouth as she opens herself to advertise her need, purposeful and shameless as a flower, as a material tool of the procreant art, as a bloom that only opens in a fire. 2003. The therapist smiles behind his weary black beard. You know the phrase, radiant happiness? Imani bites the inside of her cheeks. Seems overblown. When you talk about your partner, you remind me of the angels' muggles put on the top of their Christmas tree. It's lovely. Is that healthy? Hermione asks. Doesn't it seem unsustainable? P precarious? This is five years' worth of growth. You've worked hard to be in a place where this is an adjunct to, not a requirement for your well-being. The therapist pushes the tissue box forward. I would like very much for you to learn to trust that you deserve it. Now start showing up in about an hour, says Hermione. Draco's exploring unhurriedly underneath her cashmere jumper, which is his, like he needs more than an hour. Like he needs all night. His hands travel. Oh, the burning heat of her, she murmurs. Like a blowtorch. Like a Formula One engine block. You are. He breathes in like he's already satisfied. Singular. And you, she thinks. You know, you know, you know. And you. She tilts her mouth to kiss him. The end. Thank you for listening to I'm Never Lonely When I'm With You by Pacific Rimbaud. If you would like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on YouTube, Spotify or AO3.